That's mighty sweet thing. I'm so glad to be in the house of the Lord. There's only one better place, and that's be with the Lord, isn't it? When it's uh, all the hardships and trials and troubles of life that shall blend away into a great, glorious tomorrow. And we're certainly looking forward for the time that when we will see Him. Amen. Um, someone was asking me the other day, he said, Do you think, Brother Branham, that the coming of the Lord is at hand? I said, I certainly do. Amen. said, Well, I've heard it for a long time, but I said, One day you'll hear it for the last time. So, Amen. That's right, because he, he will arrive someday. And whenever it is, I just want to be ready. I, that's, Amen. We were speaking the other day before some businessmen that were attorneys and so forth. And, and uh, they said, uh, one said, what is your, your main objective in life? I said, I'll have one. He said, what's that? I said, saving souls for Christ. That's Amen. The, the only thing that I, my highest ambition and only ambition is to see Praise Jesus God. Christ glorified. I live for that. And I'm so happy, or testimony, that 31 years is in the making now. I have humbly served Him. Amen. If I should live a million years, I had that much life to live, I'd want to live every minute of it for Him. For I, and if I knew I'd be turned down at the end, it's such a privilege to live for Him. Amen. He is so real and so good. Amen. And I have never found nothing in all my travels of life that would in any way compare with the fellowship that we have together when we're alone, he and I. Amen. There's no sweeter communion. Amen. It's greater than the love for uh, anything, for wife, children, or anything, is the love of Christ. It's so good. Now we're so glad to see this revival continuing on through the week and heard that Brother Parnell and others has been doing some great speaking here. And we are trusting that doing this revival, revival is sometimes misunderstood. Uh, someone thinks that revival is to bring new members into the church. No, revival results is that, but a revival is to revive what's already in the church. See, yeah. is, to, is to bring that... Uh, there was uh, one time I stood by the seashore, and I, I guess I've quoted it many times, but it's, it was long years ago. And it's the first time I ever seen, a, well, it wasn't a sea, it was Lake Michigan. Hope and I were up there when the World's Conference was there. That's in, I believe, about 1922, Brother Egan, the best I remember, when the World's Conference was at, at Chicago. It was my first time to see a large body of water. And I stood out there that day and seen those great waves that were just as Easter morning they had sunrise service out there. And to see those great waves move in and out and all look like they were so happy. But I got to thinking, you know, there's no more water in that lake and it going on like that than it is when it's perfectly still. It's the same amount of water. Not one drop more. But I thought, well, why does the, the winds come down and, and shake the lake up like that? It's to get all the trash out of the lake. See, it throws all the stuff to the shore. When, and then I think that's like uh, the lake having a revival. See, Amen. it shakes it and jumps it and jerks it around until all of the dross gets out. And that's Amen. just the way a revival is, is to... Let us come into the Spirit of the Lord and rejoice and Amen. make wrongs right and a closer Amen. walk and reconsecration and dedication until all the things and doubts of the world are all thrown out onto the bank. You see. Then it's a good clear running from that on. When the old ship of life begins to stir through it, oh, you don't have to watch so much because everything's out of the way. <laughs> That's Amen. good. Well, tonight we don't want to keep too long, this being Monday night and the first night of the week to our revival night. And I was so happy to announce that the revival goes on. And I have many friends, I see some brethren here and folks who have given me dreams that they have dreamed about in the last few weeks. And uh, the Lord has helped me to have the interpretation of those things. I, 
I don't know who's in our midst and how many strangers or what more, but the Lord God still gives interpretation to dreams. Amen. They're exact and perfect. And He's the same God that was in the days of Joseph when, when the king uh, dreamed the dreams and He interpreted for him and it was exact. And some of those dreams even are lasting yet today. The results still goes on. And Daniel in the days of Nebuchadnezzar and our glorious little humble pastor said a few moments ago, well, he, he just didn't want to ask me to help out some more this week. He said, I know you're tired, Brother Branham. And said, well, he said, we're just waiting and wondering. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. Uh, by the way, I had to cancel the meeting to Sydney, Australia, on the count of they wouldn't permit me a visa at this time, see, um, to leave the States at this time. And so, uh, and other things, so I can't go uh, right at this time. I don't know when I will be able to go, but soon I'll be able. But while we had to set it back a little bit, I'm going to Chicago now to the, the meeting in Chicago uh, coming up, which they had advertised that I was to be there, but not knowing to me the time that I was supposed to be there, I was to be in the Fiji Isles, where they said there be many people gather out to, in the islands. But I won't be able to take the meeting just now there because of visa rights. And But I will soon. They're just waiting. Now, I will be in Chicago. Gene, do you know what they, so that is? Does anybody know what that was advertised? I don't even know when it was. I just seen it in the Herald of Faith. That I believe it's beginning about the 4th or 5th of the month or something like that. Or it's in the next, about a week from now, 10 days. And so uh, I've been under lots of strain and I desire your prayers. Now... Tonight I have chosen for some scripture reading, if you'd like to read with me, out of St. John, the 13th chapter, just a potion. You keep your Bibles near and likes to read behind while we're reading. And immediately after this service tonight, there's going to be a wedding rehearsal here. So as soon as we're dismissed, if we'll... Rush real quickly as we can. Not rush, but as soon as the building's empty, then they want to rehearse the wedding. And there will be a wedding here tomorrow night. Two of our children in this Tabernacle Fellowship is to be married tomorrow night, as you all know. Our lovely brother David Woods is marrying uh, Mary, Marilyn Jeffries tomorrow night at the Tabernacle, just before the services. And so this wedding is to be rehearsed. Just It won't be a farm. It will be a similar formal wedding for tomorrow night. Now, before we read his word, let us pray. Father God, as we come most reverently into your presence, bearing before us that all-sufficient name of Jesus, we are assured that you will hear us because he said, Ask the Father anything in my name, I'll do it. Therefore, we come as Christian believers boldly to the throne of grace, knowing this, that if our hearts condemn us not, then we know we have our petition answered by God. Amen. And we pray that our lives be so satisfying to thee through our confession of our wrongs and His righteousness to forgive us, that our desires will be fulfilled tonight. And Lord, our greatest desire is to see Your great grace shed upon us and to forgive our sins and to heal the sickness in our midst. And you might speak to us in the way of a revelation or prophecy or just anything that you would desire to say to your church. May our hearts be receptacles unto thy spirit. May we be so connected with the main line tonight 
that the Holy Spirit could speak to our hearts and get glory out of His presence. Now, Lord, we would pray for all that are sick and needy for just before coming as our secretary brought to my desk in the last two days just long strings of names across the nation that's suffering, dying, emergencies wrote in red. And as I lay my finger on each of them coming down the page, oh God, with the presence of this church tonight, I plead your grace and mercy for each. Thou knowest every one of them and what they have need of. And we would not forget those, Lord, who are convalescent tonight that's yonder in the homes of the aged and infirmed. Oh, Lord God, many of those are blood-washed children of Thine. Oh, when we are getting old and our loved ones has forgotten, there's one consolation we have. God never forgets. All of our deeds are recorded on the book of life. And they are forever in His presence. And we would plead for them tonight, Lord. We ask for mercy for our nation and for those who are sinning and doing wrong and for those in the bar rooms and and in the different positions of sin tonight. We would ask pardoning grace, Lord. We are praying that You will so sustain us, Lord, that our hearts will be so full of love for Thee It will be our utmost desire to serve Thee and to see those saved. Bless the reading of the Word and all that we do. Humbly we'll bow our heads and thank Thee, for we ask that in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Now turn to the book of St. John, the 13th chapter. We'll read for a potion. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And supper being ended, the devil now have put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from the supper and laid aside his garments and took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he unto Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, dost thou wash my feet? Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do now thou knowest not, but thou shalt know hereafter. And may the Lord add his blessings to his reading of the word. I want to take for a, a text tonight just for a short time, the subject of images of Christ. And I want for a subject, what would this be? What does it take to make a Christian? Now I know this is altogether not an evangelistic text by no means. And yet it is an evangelistic text because the church can never progress until it knows what grounds it's progressing on. And I believe that before anybody can ever move or have real confidential faith, it's first they have to know where they stand. And how to stand after they make their stand. I believe that's essential. For you cannot just 
headlong plunge into something with faith when you don't know where you're plunging. You've got to know. And if our faith is set right and in the right position, it gives a constant satisfaction. It's just like it's been said about a woman. That maybe when she is married, if she's so so anxious to embrace her first little baby, that she doesn't hardly know, can wait, but she her anticipations is so, but behind that there is a fear if it doesn't quickly show up that she'll not have this baby. Then that drives her farther away all the time. Now there's a remedy that they do in these days. And it's worked in all ages. If that woman sees or believes that she's not going to give birth to this baby, if she'll just go out and adopt the baby, then the first thing you know, she'll have one of her own. Now that's proven correct nine out of ten times. Because that strain of wandering, oh, maybe I won't have it, but that takes that little satisfaction there, and it's maybe God's way of getting her in condition. Then she'll have her own baby. Because that scare and anticipations will finally leave her. That's the same way it is about people who want. To get healed. They, if they can just have one little visible evidence. Like Elijah when he said. Gehazi said I see a cloud about the size of a man's hand. Elijah says I hear the sound of abundance of rain. Amen. He saw the evidence. That's why many times I tell the people. Go on. Start praising the Lord. See, because that is the adopted baby. Because it's in their intellectual until it comes into their soul that they're healed. Then faith makes it right. Amen. You've got to know what you're doing. You've got to have confidence in what you're doing. Therefore, so many times we hear this expression... Oh, what is a Christian? Some people limit it to joining a church. Someone said, well, a Christian is a, a church member. Someone who takes up their affiliations with the church. I believe that all Christians should do that. But I don't believe that's Christianity. Amen. See? That's what a Christian does after he becomes a Christian. But it doesn't mean that because he does it that he is a Christian. Then some say, no, it's going to church and serving a declaration of creeds and being loyal to those things in which the church teaches. And then there are others that says that Perhaps packing a little, um, a little something on them, a, a little cross or something, that that is the sign of a Christian. Well, and then there's others who believe that perhaps maybe if they would uh, burn a candle or do some kind of a penance, that that's a Christian. If they will merely be immersed in water or they will uh, uh, do some sacrifice or give some good to the church or, or help the neighbor, buy some coal for the widow or some shoes for the orphan. That's the acts that a Christian should do, but that still doesn't make them a Christian. And then some says that if you pack an image of Christ in your car or on your wall, that 
that is the sign of a Christian. Well, then things are all right, but I don't believe that packing an image makes you a Christian. I believe that being an image of Christ makes you a Christian. It's not what we do outwardly. It's what's happened inwardly that makes us what we are. Then, therefore, if He is our image and we are in His likeness and members of His body, we should be images like Him. Then our lives should reflect the image of Christ, not in our joining church or in our packing crucifix or our emotions, but it should be in the living presence of the living God that's reflected through our life. It's been told me by authorities that before they had the days of the smelter to take the the dross out of the gold, Take the iron and the pyrite. The pyrite is so close like the real gold till it's called the fool's gold. But the way they got all that out, that they beat it out with a hammer. The Indians used to do that. And the old goldsmiths used to do it. Beat it with a hammer and turn it over and over and beat until all the dross was out of it. And the only way that they knew that it was down to the gold was when the beater could see his reflection in it. The one who was beating could constantly look until he could almost shave by his own reflection in the gold that he was beating. And when the Holy Spirit of God begins to beat on us with the gospel hammer... Until all of the things of the world is beaten out and we can reflect the image of the Lord God. Then I believe we become Christians. For the word Christian means Christ-like. And to reflect Him. Now that doesn't mean that we have to grow a long beard as the artist pictures Him having. And neither does it mean that we grow long hair as the artist pictures him having or to wear a robe as he wore for we're living in another day we don't necessarily have to be that to reflect his physical image but we must in our souls reflect his spirit image and his manner of life I do not believe that Christians consist of joining churches or creeds. I believe it's a reflection of Jesus Christ in a human being. For we are His members. The members of His body. And we bear His image, the Scripture says. Now, what kind of an image was He? He came not To be some great somebody. Yet he was. But he came as a servant. He came not to be ministered to. But to minister. Our text tonight reflects what he was. That's what makes him great in my estimation. Yet being the very God of eternity. The very God who created the heavens and earth. And when he came here, he took the lowest position, the most desirable job that anybody could have. That was a foot wash flunky. All the pains of the early days in the oriental world, the foot wash flunky was the lowest paid man of all. For in those days, animals walked on the highways at the little byways that they went by and along the road it stunk all along the road where the animals were and the dust flew up and got on their legs and in their feet and such an awful stink as there was 
And as soon as someone come to visit another, he could not come in in that manner. He smelt bad. From the stink of the road and the dust like around the delivery stable. So the first thing he did, he had a little booth, a reception booth. And the lowest paid man on the place, just like some slave, stayed back in there to wash the feet of this guest that was coming. And give him another pair of shoes to put on little sandals to slip it on him. And then he was anointed. And then with the oil and he could go in then to be the guest of his friend. Because he'd feel all out of place going in. So full of the stink of the, the robes. And sweaty and so forth. And the foot wash flunky was paid less than any man that there was. And the God of heaven Amen. humbled himself to be the greatest that there was become the lowest that there was. What a difference of the so-called reflecting Christian today. What a difference. Why the so-called Christian today wants to be served. Or he begins to think that he's somebody. What a difference from it was from his, reflecting him. He never come to be ministered to, but he be he come to minister. Let he that's greatest among you be the servant of them all. And we have seen today that our modern trend of Christianity is I'm somebody and you're nothing. Oh, it's a it's wrong. It should not be that way. We are trying to reflect Christianity in the wrong way. God doesn't want us to do it that way. He, we sang the song to be like Jesus, but it, when it comes to humble our pride and to get down like He did, then we draw a line. And in doing so, man has formed denominations. That they can separate themselves. Seemingly not having the spirit. As the scripture said. They separate themselves. We belong to a a certain, certain church. It's It's a bigger church. It's a better church. Our denomination is a greater denomination. That doesn't act like Jesus That doesn't reflect his love and his personality. He came to the lowest, to the street harlot, to the beggar, to the bum, and got right down in the dust with them. That's the Christian life. That's the way it should be, to reflect him in that way. Oh, I know people say, that's... uh, that's days are past. It isn't. If Christ still remains Christ, if His Spirit is still the Holy Spirit, that was in Him being you, it'll make you take that position too. <laughs> but today we try to think that we're different. How far it is from His prayer when He prayed that this would all men know that we were His disciples when we have love one for another. And instead of that, we fuss at one another. We despise one another because we don't agree upon certain things. And we go out and and accuse each other. See, we're and yet claim to be Christians. I know people who claim to be filled with the Holy Spirit is guilty of such things. Going out and, and really saying evil things about other Christians. When they ought not to do those things. Now, brother, sister, when we have that kind of spirit, we might as well get in our mind that we're not Christians yet. No matter how much we confess, it's what we possess that counts. We cannot be Christians and not love all peoples. We might differ with peoples, but Jesus didn't put in and say, When I hear all you Pharisees, you're all going... To hell and there's no chance for you because of this, that, or the other, because you are a Pharisee. But he went to them 
and he ministered to them and he helped them. He'd done everything that he could to help them. But today that educations and church membership and ties of the world has brought the church together in such a way until the intellectual has taken the place of the spiritual. You cannot get to God except by the Spirit. There's only one way that a man can come to God and that's through the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, no man can come to me except the Father draws him first. That's just as true as it can be, Christian. We want to take a little notebook tonight in our heart and count up these things now. Let's think this. Oh, some of us claim to have all the knowledge. We have those who say, now wait, they love to be doctors and holy fathers and so forth. But knowing all of this, if you had all the knowledge, it wouldn't do you any good. Except you was had a spirit in you of love. The Bible said, though I have all knowledge and have not charity, I'm nothing. And what good does our knowledge do when someone say, I wouldn't go to a revival like that because those are not educated people. I, I wouldn't associate with them. No matter whether they don't know their ABCs or not, they can know Christ. Amen. Certainly, they never can get too low. May God always keep that spirit in me. No matter how low, low, what he believes, what he doesn't, what creed, color, what I want to reach a hand out to help him. Sure, I want that spirit in me. I will not think I'm better than somebody else. I can stick my chest out and say, all the people stand when I come in. Or I have the greatest campaign of them all. Who am I anyhow? But the clay that God has made. Let me humble myself that his life will be reflected. Let's all Christians feel like that. Knowledge gets us nowhere. For instance, what if there is a cage full of canaries? And the cage is the size of this tabernacle. And one little canary bird flies up in the cage and said, Gentlemen, I want to tell you all something. I happen to be just a little superior to you all. You see, I'm, I'm a canary that knows all about the human beings. Oh, I can explain it all. I've seen the lady walk through the house. I've seen the children play. I know all about it. Now, you all listen to me. And about the time he's uh, pouting off his little brain, a Princeton University college man steps up with a polishedness of grammar. And he begins to carry a conversation with that little canary bird. Using the highest grammar that he can and speaking to this little canary bird. I'd imagine the little fellow turn his head sideways. He would listen from one side to another. But he don't know a thing he's talking about. Um, Yet he can hear him. Yet he can see him. But what does his knowledge amount to nothing? Because he don't know what the man's talking about. Why? He's got a canary brain. He hasn't got a human brain. He just understands as canaries understand. And that's the way the human is. I don't care how intellectual you are. We still got canary brains. Because we're only human beings. God's known by the Spirit. And by the revelation, by the Holy Ghost, we'll never be able to understand through intellectuals. Amen. You might talk and inter and have intellectual meetings and psychology as much as you want to, and people will never know God. Amen. They can't. You can explain and say the people that cry and turn the other cheek are just the old fashioned. But that's a man that's reflecting Christ in his life. Amen. A man who is humble. A man who will walk with God or act like Jesus. Amen. But you see, the little bird couldn't understand. Yet he thought he could. Because he's not made that way. His intellect will not compare with the intellectual of this smart student. 
And neither will our intellectuals ever match God. How can our little infinite mind ever compare with the finite mind or the finite mind of us ever compare with the infinite mind of God? Amen. That infinite mind of God is so far beyond human intellectuals Amen. until it would never be. The only way that bird will ever know what the man's talking about is by yielding himself and accepting it and doing whatever he thinks that the man wants him to do. That's the only way we know God is to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's old-fashioned. It's God's program. It's always been God's program, and it always will be God's program. Amen. Not by power, not by might, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord. That's where it comes. Longfellow once said this. The way to succeed is to find a worthy cause that's being talked about. A worthy cause that's being talked about and then hold on to it. Sure. Something is being talked about, turned down by, by science, and if it's worthy, then hold on to it. Do you know in 1872, the Medical Association of the United States turned down bathtubs? They said they are absolutely insanitary and said they will scatter diseases. <laughs> bathtubs, they finally come to it. And this old-fashioned gospel that we're talking about washed in the blood of the Lamb. It may seem old-fashioned, but they'll have to come to it sooner or later. It's a worthy cause. Hold on to it with all you've got. It's a blood wash way. It cleans a man up. Not going out here drinking and smoking and rallying around and calling themselves Christians because they belong to a church. It's that clean, unadulterated Holy Spirit in a human life that reflects Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's why people today reject the new birth. Oh, they've got what they call the new birth. A way of shaking hands with the pastor. But that's not a birth. The reason they they won't accept it, that's why they go join churches. Because they can come in some intellectual way. God said, except that man be born again. He cannot even Amen. see the kingdom of God. Amen. No matter how intellectual you may be. Or how good a Christian you claim to be. You've got to be born again. Amen. You say, then Brother Branham, I'll have to come to some little mission. That doesn't mean that. It means you've got to receive the new birth. You've got to be born again. This is a mixed audience, but I'm going to say something. What is a birth? If a birth happens on a straw tick, or if it happens on the floor, or in a hospital that the rooms are decorated in pink silk, it's a mess any way you take it. That's right. And so is the new birth. It's a mess any way you take it, but it produces life. Amen. Hallelujah. It produces life. Amen. What kind of life? Servant life. To humble yourself. To deny yourself. That's the kind of life. Oh, they say, but I've seen them cry and boo around the altar and carry on. Sure, they're being born. It's a mess. I don't care where you go. Amen. You might get up your face all full of tears and your eyes red and your hands raw from beating on the altar, but it's a burst. It does something to you. It makes you a servant. It takes the starch out of you. It makes image, molding, new life, new creation. You may be all messed up when you get up, but you're born again. No matter where you are, it makes a new life. It brings a new image life. It makes a servant out of you. You want to serve, Dan. Jesus wants us to serve one another. Love, love one another. And as we serve each other, we serve Him. Now remember, it's only the sick that demands attention, service. Just the sick. They demand attention. And when you see a preacher... 
And may I not only limit it to a preacher, but may I limit it to every church member that wants attention. I'm somebody. Just remember there's a spiritual sick person. They're needing attention. They need the attention of the Spirit of God to give them something that will take that attitude out of them and heal them from their selfishness and big ideas and big me and little you. The Holy Ghost makes us all the same. Too much spiritual sickness. Anemics. You know what anemia is? It's someone who hasn't got any blood. They walk funny. They're topsy, tipsy, topsy all the time. That's what's the matter with many of our church members today. They are anemics. They need a blood transfusion of Calvary. Amen. That'll give them rich royal blood to make them walk in the old-fashioned Holy Ghost shoot out way Amen. of God. That'll give them something to live for. Give them a confidence that will make them walk in the image of their Lord. For myself, if I had a choice to make, I wanted to be like he was. He came to be a shepherd, and he was a shepherd. A shepherd is one who goes after his sheep. A famous picture. I don't think we have it on our wall here. But I've sat in my room and looked at it. I just can't call the artist's name at this time. But when he lost that little black sheep. And he leaves a 90 and 9 and goes to look for it. What does he do? He strays through the wilderness. He cuts himself with briars. He pulls through the dangerous prowls. All through the night. Until finally way down on the side of the mountain. Hanging by a little bush. Risking his own life. He reaches and takes the little fella. Out of its fallen condition. Then he brings it back to himself. And another artist painted the picture of him bringing it home. Now it looks like that the shepherd would just stick his arm on the sheep. And start bringing it like that. But did you notice how the spirit caught the artist's brush? He didn't put it under his arm. He put it over his shoulders. Now I want you to see the care of the shepherd. Now Jesus, when he was casting out devils, he said he'd done it with the finger of God. Now, if a devil's bothering you, the only thing it takes of God, it's just so insignificant until he just takes his finger and casts it away. But when a sheep comes home, where is the strongest part of a man? Across his shoulders. Do you notice how a man always, his shoulders is the biggest. Where can he pack his greatest load? Across his shoulders. Where is he the most surest of when the load's across his shoulders? So he takes the sheep, lays it around over his shoulders, and gently walks back with it. All the powers of God wrapped up in that little lost fellow bringing him back. But a devil so easy he just casts it out with his finger. He's a shepherd. A shepherd has to stray to find the strain. And a good pastor is a shepherd. Frankly, the, the word pastor means shepherd. And sometimes in the church... A little cult or a little click will rise up in the church. One side will get one way and one side the other way. A real good shepherd will go with that click. What to do to bring him back? A real true shepherd. What's he doing? He'll stray himself. What to do to bring back the lost? What's he doing? He's reflecting the image of the good shepherd. Trying to win that soul back. Yet they got off in some place, brother, like they was going to tear the world up overnight. That pastor will go right along in order to get them right, win them right back this way again. That's a good shepherd. He's reflecting the image of Jesus. Brother, I know it's called heresy. It's called fanaticism. But if I had a choice to make tonight, my choice would be to be like him. I don't want anything in my life. 
to reflect the image of the Lord Jesus. My life. I'm going after tomorrow night after this wedding. I'm going into the wilderness. And I mean to stay there because I weigh down in my soul. I feel that I need a close walk with God. Amen. I don't want to just walk. I try to walk right before Him. But I, I want a closer walk with Him. While the Branham Tabernacle is having a revival, I want one myself. I just don't want it to happen in the building. I want it to happen in me. I want a closer walk. I want more of the Holy Spirit in me to reflect Christ in me. I want to be like Him. I know that every true true Christian wants to be like Him. That's my heart's desire, to be like Jesus. I want Him to be my... I want him to be, the, he is the example of what I want to be. And look, it'll take the Holy Ghost to do that. That's the only thing can do it. Amen. I'm not interested in seminaries and what somebody's got to tell me. I don't care about kissing crucifix or pulling them to your heart or saying prayers to the dead. Amen. I'm interested in one thing that's more of the Holy Spirit to take over Amen. William Branham. Amen. I'm not interested in joining a greater church than what I belong to. I belong to the real church of the living God. The firstborn. I was born into it. And I want more of the Holy Ghost in my life to reflect Christ who I love. I don't care what plane or level I have to come on to to get it. I don't care if I have to go here, go there, be called fanatic, holy roller, whatever it may be. I want more of his life to be reflected. I'm not interested in the plane I have to come on. I'm interested in the Holy Ghost. So I can be more of a servant like he was. He was the Lord's servant. Never come to be served or to minister to. Never come for he to be ministered to, but to minister to. He took the place of a servant. And if the king of heaven could do that, and we're the members of his body, let's all be likewise. Not be different, but humble ourselves in his presence. No matter what the world's got to say or the intellectual people, think nothing about that. Just receive more of the Holy Ghost and be like Jesus. Humble, meekly, Lowly, take his place. And he'll take yours at the judgment. Let us bow our heads just a moment. Would I see tonight a group of hands in this building of the members of this church and other churches? When I say this church, I only mean there's only one church. That is the church of the newborn, the church of the firstborn, the church of Jesus Christ who's not born of the world, but born of the Spirit of God. Could I see a bunch of hands go up and say, God, make me like Jesus. Mold me, O Lord. Wash me, O God. God bless your heart. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Lord, there's little kinks and curves in my life. I've been sitting listening to Brother Purnell and Brother... Uh, Brother Neville and the other fine ministers and, and Brother Collins and many of those brethren who are preaching. I've been listening, but Lord, tonight, I just come to this conclusion. What are they telling me? What are they trying to get over to me? I see that they're trying to get me to be like Jesus. And there's no way for me to do it. I, I'm a leopard. I got spots enough. I'll lick them. i just make them whiter. They just become more plainer to the world. Lord, let me lose myself. I don't care what kind of a mess it looks like to the world. I want to be born again of the Spirit of God. And I want you, Lord, to fill me tonight with your Holy Spirit. Wash me, sanctify me. Let the blood of Jesus sanctify me. Cleanse me and fill me. Until I lose myself and find it, Lord, in thee. O oh Lord God, the creator of the heavens and earth who brought again the Lord Jesus from the dead, brought him by the quickening spirit of the eternal God. 
brought up that body that you dwelt in and has raised it to the throne of heaven. He come to the lowest that there was in the earth, the prostitute, and become the lowest servant, went to the lowest city, dealt with the lowest people, received the lowest name, and become the poorest of the poor, even to nature. The birds had nests. And the foxes had dens, but the Son of Man had not a place to lay his head. And yet that quickening spirit who honored that true servant, that made himself a servant that we might have an example to go by, it raised him up from the pits of hell, brought him by the grave and brought that body out and set it in the heavens of heavens until he's exalted so high till he has to look down to see the heavens. And give him a name above every name that's named both in heavens and earth. Lord, may we receive his spirit tonight. May that be the hunger of every heart in here. You've seen the hands that went up. Lord, not to say creeds or not to join churches or, or fuss upon these things or that, but to be humble in our hearts. To be made conformed to the image of God. May it be done by the Holy Spirit, Lord. May God's Holy Spirit make us, not by intellectual conception that we should be and we'll act like it, but that's adopted, baby. But Lord, may it really happen by the Holy Ghost and a new birth that transforms us by the renewing of, the, of our spirit to make us like Him. Hear my prayer, Lord. It's feeble. I know, Lord, it's feeble. Not only am I praying for those who held their hands, but for my own hands who went up. Make me like Him. God, no matter what you have to do to me, what planes I have to come on, make me like Him. I want to be like Jesus in my heart. Grant it, Lord, and not only me, but make all these here tonight thus. Grant it, Father, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Church membership is all right. I have nothing against it or any of those things. But, brother, to be a Christian means to be conformed to the image of Christ. We want to be living images. Not pack an image, but be an image of the Lord Jesus. There's a little song that I want you to help me to sing right now. I don't know why I can't sing it, but I'm sure you all can help me to be like Jesus. How many ever heard it? I know we all want to be that way, so let's sing it to Him. I'm conscious that the great Holy Spirit is here. You couldn't hide. David said, I make my bed in hell, yet He'll be there. He's going to be everywhere. So He's right here tonight. He knows every move, every action, everything that we do, every look, every thought. He knows all about it. Don't you believe that? Amen. So, to be like Jesus, to be like Jesus, on earth I long to Don't you like that? Listen to this now. From Bethlehem's manger Came forth a stranger On earth I long To be like him All through life's journey From earth to No, 
know what goes back in my mind right now? Yesterday, I picked up the old ledger of the church. It's been, I haven't seen it. Well, frankly, it's the first time I ever looked into it. I had to use it. When the church was first founded, there was Brother Seward's name on there. And there was Brother George D. Hart, Brother Weber, all them names on there. And I seen down the little Sunday school classes. I seen our total offering of five classes was a dollar and sixty cents for this tabernacle, with hundreds sitting here. Dollar and sixty cents. See. Then I looked at the chart for today. Now I thought, how many's gone? I seen Brother Frank Broy there, Ma. That's my father-in-law. I seen uh, all them old timers, Mrs. Weber, all them old timers. They've all climbed up the ladder, gone upstairs. They're all gone. I remember when we used to stand here and I thought, Lord God, our church may look a little better. And we're anticipating a building one. But Lord, do you love us any more now than you did then? No, I don't believe he does. When we used to stand and say, I only long to be like him. All through life journey, I see little old George with his collar open like that, the sweat running off of him, winding his handkerchief between his fingers. I can see those dear old sainted faces back there crying with their hands up. Preachers walked into the building and said, Hey, boy, how do you get people in one accord like that? I said, I had nothing to do with it. They were formed and transformed to the image of God down on an old sawdust bench down under somewhere where they found Christ in their heart. What a sweet-smelling Savior those prayers was that went up constantly all night long. We'd sometimes come in to go to one another's house and go home at the break of day, pray all night long. We don't find that sincerity no more. It seems like it's all gone. What's the matter? What's the matter? Let's go back to the first love we had and just... Be like Jesus to be like Jesus on earth I long to be like Him all through life's journey from earth to you really let's sing it with your hands up just to be like Jesus be like Jesus conform to his image oh. love one another to be like we're members of his body we must be like him all through life Isn't that a sweet spirit? I'd rather have it than anything I know in the world. Uh, you can take all the rest of the world and its fancies, all your intellectuals, all your doctors, rabbis, bishops, holy fathers, give me Jesus. That's right. Just let me have him that old-fashioned way of feeling way down in my heart and watching my lives and see my desires is to serve him, humble, meek, and lowly. That's what we need, friends, is a re That's Jesus. That's the Jesus of the Bible. Not a Jesus of the intellect, but a Jesus of the soul. Amen. He's here tonight. Amen. How many sick and needy? Raise your hand. Needs Christ. You're sick. Won't be prayed for. Raise your hands up high so I can see who you are. Well, how many has a desire in their heart to pray for somebody else that's sick? I see your hands go up. All right. <laughs> There's quite a few of them. How many believes that Jesus is still the same? We don't have no prayer cards out. I don't, there's no prayer cards, was there? I, I don't think that he was around. Do you believe that Jesus, our Savior, can come tonight to us? And if we sing and I talk of reflecting his image, what would he do if he stood here? Do you think he would do like he did in John 4, 
where he seen the woman at the well and told her know what was on her heart and explained it to her and told her and she knew he was the Messiah. You believe that? You believe that that same Jesus that that is a high priest the hand of God? You believe that same Jesus tonight that walking along one day and there was no prayer line, but there was a little woman who had a blood issue. She pressed through the crowd till she touched his garment, went back and sat down, and Jesus turned around and said, Who's touched me? You believe that Jesus is still the same Jesus? And her desire in her heart, see, she was scared. She went back and sat down. She waited. And Jesus said, Who touched me? And the, the Peter, the apostle, rebuked him and said, Lord, why everybody's touching you? He said, yes, but this was a different touch. Virtue went out of me. I, I felt it. And he looked all around through the audience until he seen that little woman. And he told her that she had a blood issue and her faith had made her whole. Amen. Is that the Jesus? Amen. Would, could we humble ourselves tonight and become transformed by the renewing of our spirit by the Holy Spirit that we could yield our lips, our eyes and your faith and my faith that He would come out in the audience and move in you and move in me to fulfill His Word that He's a high priest of our confession. He sits at the right hand of God to make intercessions upon our confession. He also is a high priest that can be touched the same way He was when He was here on earth by the feeling of our infirmities. Do you Amen. believe that? Amen. That same Jesus. Amen. How many in here has a need for yourself or somebody else? Some of you that I do not know. Somebody that you know what I don't know that. I say it like that. I do not know nothing about you or your request, but you believe that Jesus is here to conform Himself, to make Himself visible to us, to act in us the same way He did when He was in Jesus Christ. You believe that? Raise up your hands. Any of you that knows I don't know you now. I don't know you. Well, let's see. Where can we concentrate first time? Now, be reverent. If He will do this, will you believe Him with all your heart? Amen. I just feel, I was going to call you up here and lay hands on you. Don't believe I'm going to do that. I believe Jesus is here. We, not to... Not to pack an image of Him, but be an image of Him. That's the Jesus we want, isn't it? To be an image. All right. Now, Lord God, here's a great statement. But it is You, Lord, who made the promise. Now we must press forward. Now something must be done, though we are not a, even a denomination. We're just a little humble, poor bunch of overrun people that many of us would be kicked out of big intellectual churches. If we went, we couldn't dress like they did. And then another thing, if we would raise up and the Spirit would bless and we'd say, Amen, as the Scripture says, we'd be turned out immediately. And many would not be received. Some of them because of their color. Some of them because of their creed. Some of them because that they love you so much. And they've they got the Spirit. They're dead to the things of the world. And it's been born anew. But they've got new life. Servant's life. But we have gathered here, Lord, under this little roof that you give us that we appreciate. Now, Lord, let it be known that you're Christ the same. And at this great one that we're speaking of, He's present now to make known and to do just as He did when He was here on earth. Grant it, Father, that they might see and believe. For I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you believe that what you ask for, you get? What is faith? Faith is truth. Faith is something that you know positive of. Faith is not nothing you guess at. Faith is what you know. Something that comes down into your soul. I wish those who doesn't know me, and I don't know you, and still you have a request or desire, would you raise your hands again? I just want to get a, a general idea. Every person in here that I don't know. All right, it's just everywhere. 
I don't like to speak to people that I know because some would say, he knows them. But there's many hands that went up that I didn't know. Now, if the Lord Jesus will grant this, will the rest of you believe it with all your heart and accept Amen. your healings and whatever it might be? Yes, Please. Let's, let's just in our hearts pray. Jesus, take all the doubt away. Yep. Well, Jesus can't doubt. If we're in His image, we believe. He believed God. He come to do the will of God. He didn't care what man said or anyone else said. He come to do one thing, to be a servant to his Father. And his Father dwelled in him. We come to be the servant of God. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. We want to serve him. I'm going to concentrate on a woman, a colored woman sitting right back here. I believe she raised her hands that I didn't know her. Being a, well, there's two of them there, all right? Neither one of you ladies know me or I know you. If that's right, raise up your hands. I don't know you. Raise up your hands. All right? all right? We're strangers to each other. In the scripture that was spoken, the reason I noticed you're, you were colored people, see. There was a woman one time in the Bible, the fourth chapter of St. John. Jesus came by the well and there was a Samaritan woman. She was a, a woman of a different race. And Jesus spoke to her just a few moments till he found out what her trouble was and told her what her trouble was. And when he told her her trouble, she said, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. Now, we know when the Messiah cometh, he'll tell us these things. But they didn't understand who he was. Why, she said, to he, Who are you? And Jesus said, I'm he that speaks to you. She went back into the city from whence she come and said, Come see a man who told me the things that i done, told me what's wrong. Isn't that the very Messiah? Did you women ever read that? Sure. St. John, the fourth chapter. Well, if Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and you're standing 20 yards from me, you're sitting, rather, do you believe that same Jesus speaking between us could reveal to me what you're wanting from here? If I've told you the truth, this Bible being right, he can do it, can't he? If he will do it, You'll believe it? The woman at the end looking to me this way, she's suffering with a back trouble that she wants to be healed of. That's exactly right. If that's right, raise up your hand. Lady at the end. There you are. Now what about you, lady? You believe too? I believe you said you're just a stranger to me also. Next to her. You have trouble with your head. And you got a skin trouble too. If that's right, raise up your hand. Now go home. You're both to be well. Your faith made you well. Amen. You believe that Jesus is here tonight? Amen. What about some of you rest of the building somewhere else? Believe. Here's a woman sitting here praying. She's a warrior. I know her. But I can't help because that light's hanging over. That's Miss Bruce. Now, Miss Bruce, I don't know a thing about what's wrong with you. You were healed with a cancer one time. But right there at that door, the first time I ever saw, told, saw you standing in that door, the Holy Spirit told me something that nobody knows besides you and a doctor. That's right, isn't it? Do you believe he can tell me what's wrong now? I know you, but I, I don't know what's your trouble. I have no idea. Because you're healed of the cancer, but I can't help that light hanging over you. It's staying right there. Now I see somebody else rising up. It isn't for you. It's for somebody who's got cancer. That's exactly right. And then I see a woman or something. She's a sinner or something. You have a habit of drinking or something. And you're packing two handkerchiefs on you for me to lay my hands on for their, for their deliverance. That's thus saith the Lord. That's Amen. exactly right. Now you be the judge. Is that right? If that's right, raise up your hand. Somebody back in here that I don't know, raise up your hand. Somebody that I don't know. Here, there's, what is that? Raise up your hands again right there in the corner. There's four or five women sitting there. Do you believe me to be his servant? Do you believe that what you see is operated by the Spirit of God? You do? If you can believe. The woman sitting looking at me with the little hat, glasses on, white looking earrings. Yes. It's not for yourself. 
It's for somebody else. And they're in serious condition. It's uh, inward bleeding. They're in a hospital. And that hospital is New Albany. That's the truth. Thus saith the Holy Spirit. The young woman, did you raise up your hand? The woman at the other side looking at me this way. You believe me? You have a desire on your heart? You believe that God could reveal it to me? All right. You're for praying for somebody else too. If someone's got cataracts on their eyes, they're afraid they're going to go blind. That's true. Now, if you believe for her, she won't go blind. If you believe. The woman right straight back on the end there. Back behind the woman raised up her hand. You got a nervous condition. That's right. Your nervousness is in your throat. That's right, isn't it? Raise up your hands if those things are so. You women there. I'm talking all right. What was that next woman there? Was the, you raised up your hand too, sister there? Raise up your hand there, elderly. All right. You got rheumatism that you won't pray for. That's right, isn't it? Raise up your hand. You believe? Somebody, somebody in the back of the church believe. Have faith. I see a woman looking right straight at me. She's looking between two women. Right here, she's got her finger up to her mouth. She's facing an operation for appendicitis. That's exactly right. That's right. Raise your hand, lady. There she is. You believe? What is it? It's Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Do you believe with all your heart? I just want to To be like Jesus. To be like Jesus. On earth I long to be like Him. All through life's journey. I see the deadness of the church of this day. What would have happened in the days of the Lord Jesus when that took place? That woman was so thrilled, she dropped that water pot and into the city she went. She said, the Messiah is here. But today, yes, you haven't got messy enough down at the altar to receive a new birth yet. There's something wrong somewhere. That would send the Holy Spirit through this place here, would set a revival. The reflection of Jesus Christ, His image conform here, moving amongst the people. To do that, what's the matter? There's something lacking. We need a revival. How many others are sick? Raise your hands. It's sick and needy. Lay your hands on one another. Let's pray. Right quick now. Put your hands on one another. Be ready to receive your healing. If you'll believe with all your heart, you can be healed right now. I was amazed. We're talking about a woman at birth. I've never had yet in my life one woman, as I know, I've ever walked to the platform desiring a baby. What happens if I could see her and see it happen? Her longing desire for the right thing. I say to her, lady, you're seeking a baby. She said, yes, Brother Branham. I know of a woman 49 years old. Got a little boy baby now. All of her life she lived with this man since, well, since about 16 years old. She's 49 and he's 50-something. And soon as said, Thus saith the Lord. That's right. You shall have this baby. She went home and bought the clothes for the baby. Three years later, being 52 years old, she gave birth to the little boy that she longed to have. Why? When she heard it spoke, she knew it had to happen. What did it do? It put her in the right attitude. If these, the Holy Spirit's so good to come and speak these things to the people... If you'll, if you'll get the right attitude now, the healing's finished. Oh, Lord, you're God, and you're God forevermore. Oh, amen. And we are, we are so happy to know that you promised that you would have a remnant when you come to the earth. Regardless of what goes or comes, there's going to be people that's going to be ready. We know that there's a tithing that man gives to God. And there's a tithing amongst the people Perhaps maybe we'd say a tenth of all the world's harvest through the ages 
will be that elected that's been called. Oh, Father, we pray as we are laboring here, all of us together, searching through the city, trying to bring in sinners, trying to do something for the kingdom of God. We go down in the city. We watch the indifference. We see it. And as Lot and Sodom, it vexes our souls daily to see women smoking cigarettes and, and claiming to be Christians and drinking and crousing and wearing immoral clothes and, and man lusting and all the sin of Sodom. Our hearts are grieved within us, Lord. Oh, no wonder faith becomes at a low ebb when people are like that, lacking the blood of Jesus that would sanctify their souls and set them afire for God. Yet they will not receive it. And the little missions on the corners are beating the tambourines and the drums are in their corners and they're laughing at us, bringing in the saints of the living God. Oh, how we thank you, Father, for some plane somewhere that'll preach the gospel, that'll reach out the hands for the people. Grant, Lord, just now, as we pray and know that your great Holy Spirit and the angels are, are in their positions here in this church. God, forgive every sin. The people are sick here tonight. There's many of them. You've showed yourself to be here, Lord, through your servants. Many of them out there who was reaching and calling and pulling. And, Lord, you know that, that you're the only one who could permit this to be done. You're God and God alone. And you do it for the very purpose that you promised that you would do it. And it's the last sign to the church as you spoke. The end time is here. Then you ask this question, will I find faith when I come to the earth? You never ask, will I find church members? Will I find creeds? Will I find sincerity? You said, will I find faith when I come to the earth? Lord, may these sick people let their faith loose. Come away from the frustrations and doubts and fears. May their faith be turned loose just now. And if they turn their faith loose, the Sickness will have to turn loose. The devil will leave his hope. And they'll be set free by the power of Almighty God. Let the Holy Ghost surge every heart, baptize every soul, and heal everybody that's in divine presence. Grant it, Lord. For this I ask that the devil leave every person that they're tormenting in here tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, Satan, turn yourself loose from these people. As a servant of God, I cry in their behalf. Asking for mercy for them. Amen. How many believes with all your heart now, with all that's in you, that Jesus Christ is reflecting Himself on the earth today among His people? Do you love Him? And let us sing this old song together. I love Him. I love Him because He first loved me. All together while we stand now. Everybody now. All together. How many knows it? Raise your hands. I love Him. Let's worship Him now. All the sick, all the afflicted, stand up to your feet now. Receive your healing. I believe, and with all my heart, if you'll just let your faith go right now, the Christ of God whose presence is to, what is He doing? Making us His image. Amen. See, His Spirit here reflecting Himself right out to you. How, you know it isn't me. I don't know those people ever who they were that raised their hands. They raised their hands if they didn't know me, and I raised my hands I didn't know them. But God knows them. What is it? It's the Christ reflecting Himself. It's your faith to believe it. It's my faith to a ministry that He confirmed it to me by an angel whose picture you see that hangs in the religious halls of art and works all over the world. It's known. The pillar of fire that led the children of Israel. When it was made flesh, it was in a farm called the Son of God. He said, I come from God and went to God. I'll go back to God. After his death, burial, and resurrection, Paul met him on the road to Damascus in a form of a pillar of fire and a light that put his eyes out. Paul said, Who are you, Lord? He said, I'm Jesus. It's hard for you to kick against the prick. Jesus said, A little while in the world, cosmos, the world order, the church members and so forth won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me. For I, personal pronoun, I, the same Jesus, will be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. And the works that I do shall you do also. More than this shall you do, for I go to my Father. Amen. Oh, I love Him. I love Him.
Oh, I always sing that again. I want the Methodists and Baptists and Pentecostals and Nazarenes and Pilgrim Holiness, Church of God, all, all of you together. I want you to shake hands with somebody in front of you and back of you and your side of you while we're doing it now. All together. I... Now this is the order of the resurrection. We which are alive and remain shall not prevent them which are dead. For the trumpet of God shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Meet one another before we meet Him. Meet one another before we meet Him. Be caught up together with Him, with them to meet the Lord in the air all together. Now we met one another, shook one another's hands. Now let's greet him. I love him. I love him. Because he first loved me. And purchased my side. A young woman fell right out of the line, come right up and knelt the altar sobbing and crying. Would there be others here that feels that same conviction would like to kneel with her? We'd be glad for you to come right up and take a place. God bless you, brother. Would someone else move right up? That's fine. I Mow me, Lord, and make me. I Go down to the potter's house. Someone else come to take the place. Blessed Lord, this young woman thou knowest I do not, but there is some strange thing struck her just a few moments ago that out from that audience she come without any persuasion. That was you, Lord. She knelt here at the altar while loved ones near with her arms around her. Asking for mercy and for guidance and for spiritual strength to her. Let it be done, Lord. It is written, now let it be done. That you will withhold no good thing from them that walk up right before you. Your promises are yea and amen to all those who will love you and will follow you. Let the young woman know this definitely tonight, that there is nothing in the heavens that's promised in the Word of God but what God is more than willing to pour it right into her heart at this time. May there be such a satisfying potion given to her while she's knelt prostrate at the altar. May the Holy Ghost give to her those things that's desirable in her heart. Grant it, Lord. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. He first loved me and purchased my salvation.
While these people are concentrating themselves, concentrating themselves to the Lord, while His Spirit is moving in the building, I would we'd stand still just a minute. The pastors are dealing with them at the altar. Let's be in prayer just for a moment now. He's coming along, and let's us be singing now. He's speaking to each one. Let's bow our heads so we be in prayer. Just my salvation on the tree. I love him. I love him because first. deep walk with God, believing He'd give it to you, if you'll believe with all your heart, you can have it. You believe it, you accept it. Love him, raise up your hands. I love him. Hallelujah. All that is within him. Isn't he wonderful? While we bow our heads just for the closing prayer, remember the service tomorrow night. I'm going to ask you, is, if you will now, as quickly as possible, each one of you that raise your hand for salvation, close your walk, believe you have it. If you can't feel it, take the adopted child. Amen. See? Keep saying you have it until it becomes a reality. Amen. You that accepted healing, 
and you don't feel any difference, you say, my, my faith is not enough to move it right now, Brother Branham. Take the adopted child away. Just keep saying, Lord, I am healed. I believe it. It'll come. It gets you the right mood, you see. And then your faith will be right. It'll take it. You just believe it with all your heart. Now, tomorrow night, the services will begin at 7.30, right. regular time, tomorrow night, and every night this week. Amen. Come out and hear, Brother Neville, and these other ministers and all of us together that's trying to bring forth a revival. Amen. God bless you. We can't bring it. You've got to, you've got to bring it with us by praying, Amen. coming and making your presence here. God be with you. Now, I wish you would, just as soon as it's dismissed, as quick as you can, to, uh, out of the building. we got about a half hour of rehearsal here to take place and some of the men are working and we're going to bow our heads and I believe I heard Brother Judy um, Jackson back in the audience. Uh, Brother Junior, are you here tonight? The brother from New Albany Methodist Church. Yeah, all right, Brother. Jackson, will you dismiss us in a word of prayer? Who are to be in the wedding, come forward right quick now. The Lord bless you. We'll see you tomorrow. All of sorrow and of woe.